In this video, we're going to take a look at the Pix to Pix paper. And then in the next video, yeah, you already know it. We're going to implement it from scratch because that's just what we do, baby. All right. So the title is image to image translation with conditional adversarial networks. And so what was pretty cool about this is that you sort of have some input and it's going to map it to some output. Uh, which I guess is a bit different than to normal GANs that we've looked at previously, which is where you just have some latent noise, and then from those latent noise vector, you can generate an entire image. So, you know, this is quite different. And uh, basically what they were able to do is that they could take a segmentation map to some pretty cool uh, actual real scene, and then some satellite image to uh, to a map. A Google map image and, and do vice versa, of course. Then also some labels to facade, colorization of images, and stuff like that. So, um, what you would probably be wondering is why didn't they just use a regular CNN um, where you would just input this and then you would have a CNN that made this mapping? And um, yeah, I guess we'll get to it. So, anyways, they made a conditional adversarial network. And why it's conditional is because you send in an image rather than having that uh, latent noise that we talked about. So the idea is that we don't just learn the mapping, which we would if you just use a comnet, but we also learn a loss function. And um, so that could be a bit confusing as to, you know, when I read it first, I was like, oh, what is the loss function? But the loss function is the, is the GAN itself, right? The discriminator is inherently learning a loss function uh, instead of using some some specific one, um, and basically the the whole idea of this paper is is that using GANs even to this kind of application or this kind of a task. So the the idea of this paper is kind of that we don't have to hand engineer our loss functions, and uh, that is because it's going to be done inherently in the network. So basically, just using something like a mean squared error. Uh, which they which they uh, tried. So if we just take the naive approach uh, to minimize the Euclidean distance, uh, it will tend to produce blur results. So you know then you can kind of think about you know what do we want for our loss function, and basically you know it would be desirable if we could instead specify something like make the output indistinguishable from reality. And, you know, so that's a pretty funny way of framing your, your loss function or formulating your loss function. But in fact, you know, that's exactly what GANs do. So that is sort of, this sort of leads us to the path of using GANs instead of just using a, a normal loss. All right, so as I said, I'm gonna try to make this shorter. So I'm gonna, just gonna go to the most relevant parts. Basically, they use sort of a, a standard GAN loss, right? So they didn't use VGAN GP. Um, I guess it, so. I tried it actually on this, and it didn't work well. And that's what the authors uh, said as well. But anyways, uh, they they just used a standard GAN loss, and then basically, uh, as you can see here, the discriminator takes in x and y. So basically, if we basically if we go up again and we look at the images we had from the beginning right here it takes in the input x and the target y sort of a, a side by side um, as we send it into the discriminator so the discriminator you know gets both of these um, as its input and then you sort of concatenate them um, across the channels so that's what they did in the loss function for the discriminator and that's also what they call this uh, this conditional GAN so I guess I guess the, the generator is already conditioned on the input, but the discriminator is now also conditioned on the input. So this is in contrast to to you know how we normally do it, which is just sending the target value, I guess, for uh, the discriminator of the output. And so what they did in the loss function is that they used that sort of standard uh, loss or that, that loss that we just looked at standard GAN loss where they send in X and Y to the discriminator. But then they also um, added this additional this additional loss right here, which is an L1 loss between the target value and the generator. 
So they found it useful to use both of them. And the reason why they used L1 instead of L2 is because of that we saw before that they, uh, they mentioned that L2 produces these blurry results, uh, which L L1 doesn't suffer from. All right, so for the actual sort of uh, the, the, the model that they use, basically for the, uh, the generator, they use unit. And uh, so basically they use a small variant of unit, but the idea is the same. Uh, and hopefully you've um, you know about unit or you've watched my previous video on unit. Uh, but if you haven't, basically you take in an image, right, and you do some com layers, and then you downsample. Uh, then you do some more com layers, and then you downsample again. You do a couple of com layers. You then upsample using something like a com tran uh, uh, transpose convolution. Then you do another work with it support for some com layers, and then you upsample and then you do some com layers and then you sort of get this I guess sort of a U shape right here so that's why it's called UNET so basically uh, sort of these arrows to the right is just a in the case of UNET this is sort of a double conv so double conv and that's the same for all of these right arrows and then for the the downward part, so I guess these parts, right, that is sort of a, I shouldn't make an arrow here, that could be kind of confusing. But so the down arrows are sort of a, either a, a stride two on the comp layer or it's just a, a pooling layer. And then the upward part, the upward arrows are sort of um, comp transpose, or I guess you can use an up sampling as well. And then the difference between unit and the generator that they used is basically that they uh, just used a single comb layer for its um, for the right arrow so I guess here this is just a single comb in the case of uh, the generator in picks to picks so they use a single comb uh, and then all of them with a stride of two and um, we'll see them write that in the paper as well but they use a single comb with a stride of two uh, so they didn't essentially I guess have these downward arrows that's just included with stride 2 uh, and then they use these uh, comp transpose for the upward arrow and the other difference is that um, unit just uh, went down until they had some feature so sort of some image size of 30 by 30 or something uh, the generator in pix to pix actually goes down so it down samples until it reaches a, a one by one feature map and then it starts to upsample. Oh, and also, I guess here, sort of in between those, we should oh, we should have let's see. So in between those right here, we should also have some some arrows where we um, do some sort of skip connection right there. So we we add the um, the 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 one in the sort of the encoder, which is the left part. Uh, we add that uh, to the decoder, and I guess sort of the entire idea of unit is that uh, if we just draw a U is that in the first part, in the first half part right there, we sort of learn uh, what is in the image. So so we basically learn what is in the image by getting uh, good features. And then in the upward part, uh, we sort of uh, learn uh, where things are in the image, right? So that's sort of the conclusion of that uh, and you know in, if you want to see the the details also uh, we're going to look at some more details later on but the implementation I think is uh, going to be also pretty clear that we're going to do in the next video so then uh, both the generator and discriminator use com batch norm relu and then here it's actually kind of confusing they say relu but they also mean leaky relu so they use leaky relu uh, as well. So they use a combination of ReLU and leak ReLU. Uh, we'll see more details of that later on. And then for the discriminator, they use something called a patch GAN. And um, yeah, so patch GAN, basically, they design a, an architecture, which they call patch GAN, that penalizes structure at the scale of patches. So um, basically, or actually, let's read the next sentence. So this discriminator tries to classify if each n by n patch in an image is real or fake. So I guess what's more common, right, is that you have some image 
uh, and then you send it through a a discriminator, right? You send it through the discriminator, and you get a scalar value uh, zero or one. Uh, what they did instead is that they sort of um, outputted a, uh, an entire grid of values. So maybe we have I don't know a three by three grid output. That's not what they used, uh, but you can sort of imagine a three by three uh, grid as output instead of a one by one then just for a single scalar value where each of these values so each of these sort of uh, values in the grid are between zero zero or one right so this is going to be between zero or one if we just look at what this single um, value in the grid uh, is able to see in the original image it corresponds to seeing um, sort of a, a patch of the original image so let's say this is the original image, then the blue sort of the blue one right there, the single value between zero and one, is sort of uh, able to see from a patch of the original image, which is obviously much greater. So perhaps you know this is something like I don't know uh, twenty by twenty or something. So this single uh, value is responsible for seeing a twenty by twenty patch in the original image. And uh, yeah, so why this is advantageous is because it has fewer parameters, it runs faster, and it can be applied to arbitrarily large images. And that's the, the case because it's it's uh, just looking at a single patch, right? So you can size the image and as you know as you want, basically, because the the output is still is dependent on just a small patch of that image. So that's obviously much better than than um, you know s sending it through a bunch more comp layers and uh, making it into a single scalar value or it, it's much faster anyways all right so if we go down for sort of the optimization of this uh, they do sort of the training step is that they just use a gradient descent on the discriminator and then one on the generator and they use the standard trick of instead of maximizing or minimizing the log of one minus uh, the discriminator of, yeah, you can see this thing. They instead maximize log D of, of that. So this is sort of the standard trick, uh, which is to have non-saturating gradients. And then they use, um, this is kind of confusing actually. So they say that we use mini batch SGD with Adam solver, but those are sort of, uh, to me at least these are sort of opposites it doesn't make much sense either you use SGD or you use Atom and um, and when I look through the source code they used uh, Atom so that's what they used and then they also use these beta terms right so these are sort of ind indicative that they actually use the Atom too so they use B1, beta 1 to be 0 0.5 that's for the momentum term and I, I guess B, B2 beta 2 is for um, uh, what is it, Atagrad or something, the exponential averages or something. I don't really remember, but those are the parameters. And then, um, yeah, also they had kind of a funny way of evaluating their GAN. So I guess they had sort of a more standard metric, but they also uh, ran real versus fake perceptual studies on Amazon Mechanical Turk. So, you know, they detail it a little bit later on. So uh, Turkers, I didn't know that was a word, but Turkers were presented with a series of trials that pitted a real image against a fake image. And then on, I guess on each of those trial, the image was shown for a second and then the, the uh, labeler, I guess, the Turker were responsible to sort of um, say which one was fake. And I guess they used that to evaluate if their GAN was good or not, which is kind of funny to me, but Anyways, moving on to the more important stuff. Um, you can kind of imagine that it's um, basically what should the patch size be, right? So what should uh, each be responsible for seeing in the original image? And they tried different ones. So they used a one by one, 16 by 16, 70 by 70, and then the entire image. So that's just seeing the entire image. And basically what they found is that 70 by 70 is pretty good. Uh, using 16 by 16, we have these uh, artifacts. Um, so I guess you can see those also if you look at the image right there. So, and, and that is also what I found. 
I actually got artifacts randomly during training anyways, so I don't know, but I guess it's even more occurring when you have a larger patch. So they mentioned those as well, is that they wanted to use a 70 by 70 to alleviate artifacts, and then they achieved slightly better scores as well. And yeah, so what's good is that they mentioned that even though the images are trained on 256, they can still use it, uh, since it's sort of a fully convolutional, uh, you can still use it on larger images. And here we sort of have a photo to a map, and I guess, yeah, this is uh, 512, and it was trained on 256. And of course, I think these examples are pretty cherry-picked, but yeah, they look pretty good. And then, I, this is sort of the most, that was sort of the most important parts of the paper. But for the actual training details, and yeah, so here we can also see some, some outputs examples. And, you know, all of these are, I guess, cherry-picked. Um, because all of them look really good and i think there were some that you know were where it failed but they didn't show those but yeah these look pretty good all right so moving on after the citations in the appendix uh they sort of go through the details of implementing this and they also have a, a repository for the source code so basically uh, they used a COM batch from ReLU uh, with K filters and they denoted that CK. And then CDK is a COM batch from dropout ReLU. And then all the COM layers are 4x4 kernels with a stride of 2. So basically, the convolutions in the encoder, the downward part of the unit, uh, is uh, going, yeah, going to be with a stride of 2. And also in the discriminator, they downsample. But in the decoder, they upsample by a factor of 2 which sort of makes sense and uh, yeah so this is the generator architecture um so c here was just combat from relu so they basically just used um yeah so basically each of these convolators are gonna downsample by a factor of two and then they increase the number of channels um and that's it so in the end of this uh, i guess in the end here it's gonna be a one by one uh sort of pixel, I guess, and then, or value. And then in the decoder, the, the uh, up sample. And also, so this is the decoder without the skip connections, but what they used is that they used a unit where they added the skip connections among the channels, which meant that instead of having 512 here, we have sort of double that because we concatenate um, with the output from the encoder. So they used uh, those, and then they also used, as you can see here, they used uh, dropout here, here, and not there, anywhere there. So they used two dropouts. Um, no, actually, they used three dropouts because they used one dropout here as well. <laughs> I was kind of like, maybe I Im implemented it incorrectly, but yeah, they used three dropouts. And... Um, I guess also what could be important here is that they use some other details is that they use a 10H, right, on the generator output and then sigmoid on the output. Where did they mention that? Yeah, they mentioned that over here, I guess. Sigmoid on the output and then the relos are leaky leaky in the discriminator with a slope of 0.2. Um, and then there are some other details like they, they didn't use batch norm on the first C64 layer, and yeah, I guess that's it. All right, so that's it for this paper walkthrough of the most important parts. In the next video, we'll implement this from scratch and uh, to make things super clear. All right, hopefully this video was useful to you. Uh, like the video if you thought it was useful, and I'll see you in the next one, hopefully. All right, bye-bye.